You're listening to The Conversation, hosted by me, Ted Music, for RedMaskGroup.com. Hi, I'm Ted Busick. What you're listening to is the inaugural episode of The Conversation, an interview series I'm doing for Red Mass Group, in which I'll be talking to candidates for elected office, sitting office holders, thought leaders, and any other politically involved people that I think are interesting. In this episode, I talk with Heidi Wellman a Massachusetts Republican currently campaigning for Liz Warren's U.S. Senate seat. Heidi was very generous with her time, and while I'll reserve judgment on her positions for now, she is somebody who has a lot of interesting things to say. Hello again, Heidi. Sorry about that. I, um, uh, Heidi Wellman, tell us who you are, obviously what you're running for. Um, pretend that we've never heard of you before, which, and I, I don't want to insult you, but in this case, it, it, for some people it might be true because I feel like you've been a little bit underexposed. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, I think people like a story. They want to hear a story. And, and I have a, a background story. So let me tell you my little story here. I am I, I am registered Republican. I know there's some question as to where I stand. I'm registered Republican. I'm also a card-carrying libertarian. So I'm a bit of a hybrid. When I was growing up, I grew up in a uh, Democratic town of Rockland, Massachusetts, on the South Shore. So for a long time, I was a Democrat by default. So I have to say that I, I have a little bit of everything in me, a little um, understanding of where everybody's coming from, and and but... Ultimately, I am conservative, and I think we become more conservative as we get older. Now, I grew up in Rockland, Mass. I went to Rockland High School, graduated from Rockland High School. I was on the National Honor Society. I was a first-class Girl Scout. I was very active in politics. I started on um, issues campaigns, you know, Proposition 2.5, back in 1980 when I was I was a young kid. Uh, so I've always been involved in the background. I think most people agree that most politics is local and having been at the local level i've been one of those people that's kind of been in the background working and not looking for the limelight happy to work behind the scenes Um, my dad was a u.s marine he was in the marine corps for 10 years and he left as a staff sergeant so he's an enlisted man and my mother was an immigrant a legal legal immigrant from italy so um, if I sound a little animated, it's it's definitely that background. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I really get excited about being a patriot because my mother came here legally and she wanted to be here. I think it's important when you come here that you want to be here, that you want to assimilate into our culture because we're a melting pot, which means that, you know, for dinner sometimes I might make pierogies. I know it's Polish. It's not American, but you know what? I like pierogies, and it's, they're big in Chicopee. You can go down there and get them fresh. So I think that's part of our melting pot is is that we take a little bit from cultures that come here, and they take a little bit from us, but ultimately they need to assimilate and become one of us. And so she did, and she instilled that in all of us that you you have to want to be here. 
if you don't want to be here, then leave. And she made that clear to us. Even though you're born here, if you don't want to be here, leave. Don't don't stick around because you're a, a negative Nancy. Um, so I'm very patriotic. I get very excited when I talk about our rights because I have traveled the world and I've seen countries where those rights aren't guaranteed. In fact, uh, having you know been in Italy for a while, I went to school there for a year, uh, their legal system is absolutely upside down from ours. Here we are innocent until proven guilty, and there you're guilty until proven innocent. So if you're arrested, you're automatically guilty, and you have to prove your innocence, and it costs a lot of money, and sometimes it doesn't work. So a lot of these rights that we take for granted – I've learned that you can't take them for granted. You have to fight for every single one of your rights. Um, so I graduated from Rockland High School. Um, I was in the top 20% of my class. And then I graduated from Wheat College in Norton back when it was an all-girls school. And my specialty, my, my, um, the thing that I was studying particularly was I was a major in political science with a minor in Russian language and literature. And that should kind of clue you in to the fact that I was, I was trying to – uh, enter foreign service. I wanted to focus on international politics. And I do consider myself to be a student of international politics. I find it very interesting. I find politics interesting. Um, and I, I, I'm, I've been very much an active member, an activist, and, uh, but behind the scenes. And so that's why it's, it doesn't surprise me that nobody's heard of me because they shouldn't have. It's more important that the task get done. And I always knew that I would continue to to work at a local level, helping people, until a situation arose where I might be needed. And then, of course, now this is the important part, is come January, the incumbent U.S. Senator from Massachusetts said, I can't work with that administration. And I said, wait a minute, <laughs> you don't get to pick and choose who you work with. I mean, this isn't, this isn't that kind of a job. We elect right. you, work for us. And we expect you not to obstruct justice. We expect you not to obstruct passing laws and, and making the government work. We expect you to do your job however you need to do it. And that means working together is a little bit of give and take. So, you know, and I, I have a very strong work ethic. I'm the only candidate who really is working full time um, and trying to do this. I am a single mom. I know about how hard it is to raise three children on my own who are now adults. Um, and I'm at a point where I can give my time full time to, to working for the people that elect me. I don't have any other distractions. My children are grown. Um, my career is established. I am not struggling to try to work at my own business. Um, I've been an employee. I've been an employer. I understand how that is. But I am ready to go to work for the people of Massachusetts at, at the Senate level in the federal government to to really try to make the government work. And I think that before we do anything, we have to, to look at the fact that what plan do people have when they say that they want to run for office? Have you given it any thought as to why? I mean, that's really the question. Why do you want to run for office? My father asked me that when I was 12 years old, and I told him that I wanted to be a politician. He said, why? Because until you know why you want to run, it's, it's just a popularity contest. Are you running because you want power? Are you running because you want to make money and, you know, you're, you're crooked? Are you running because you want name recognition? Is it your ego? And I think in my case, it's that I've always wanted to help people and, and help them at a level that, that everyone can be touched as a whole. The, that I want to help people and I want to do the job correctly. I'm very task-oriented. So for me, this is a job. And it's a job where I know that I am employed by the people and I need to get a job done. So my, my priorities here is, is in cleaning up the swamp. Uh, they talk about draining the swamp. The way to do that is to limit government, keep it small, and limit the powers of the legislation, le legislators. So the way to do that is to institute term limits and to make each elected official accountable to the same laws that we as citizens are accountable. So same health care, same laws regarding uh, inside trading, all the things that we have to abide by, they should abide by. And I don't think that that, if you're an honest politician, which I know is rare, but there are some out there, um, you shouldn't be threatened by that. You shouldn't be threatened by your power being limited. And uh, so that, that's why I'm running, because I, I'm not looking to advance. I'm not looking to be a career politician. And I, 
I haven't heard any of the other candidates say that. Um, even though some of them have some background as elected officials and some of them have some background in administration, um, I haven't heard anybody say, look, I'm out here just to help people and then go back home. And that's what I want to do. I think that by le limiting term, uh, the terms of office, we'll open up to other people being able to get involved. And right now, it's they're little mi miniature dynasties where you go in for twenty years, and and that's not that's not in keeping with the principle of democracy. Uh, right. Well, they're, having... they're I would say they're dynastic, ju not just in the sense that they're so long term that it's almost like you know, it's almost like some sort of satrapy, but also they're dynastic in the sense of having these uh, like extended familial multi-generational political clans and you know not all of them are viewed unfavorably in individually the Kennedys or the Bushes or even like the Adamses or whatever I mean this is an old sort of an old phenomenon but in in aggregate the phenomenon does seem you're right I mean dynastic is the perfect word for it and I think that we as party members I think we owe it to people for us to return from office having been successful and teach the younger generation, the next group, how to be a good politician, how to run for office. One thing I've learned through this campaign, and of course, again, I was always involved in campaigning, so I, I understand the process, but certainly at this level, we're talking, there are things that I'm still learning. We're always learning. And it would be so nice if we had a process in which people could be taught, okay, this is how you do it. This is how you fill out these forms. You know, the FEC forms are... are very difficult. Um, thank goodness the people down there are very helpful, and they they'll walk you through it. But even within our party system, and and all of the parties, uh, there needs to be more training involved. And the best people to train are the people who have done it already. And I, I think that that is one thing that I can promise that once elected, once my term is over, that I will return to Massachusetts and help the next group of people to become successful. That's one you know, thing that we know each other. That's an interesting, and I would have to say it's a very cogent, but also very novel argument for term limits that I personally have not heard before. So the idea you're advancing here is if, there, if we would limit the term of service of a politician, not only would it have the obviously sort of salutary effect of, you know, higher turnover, right, so more fresh blood, but it would also give that person an incentive to, instead of spending their time, you know, figuring out how to keep their toehold on public office, instead use that time to train whoever their replacements are going to be. Exactly. Exactly. That's a really, I've, I've never heard anybody advance that as an argument before, but I think it's very, I think, like I said, I think it's very salient. I think it's, that's a very interesting thing for you to say. Okay, so, Ted, I've spent you... a lifetime thinking about this, <laughs> literally <laughs> a lifetime thinking about what I would want to bring to the table. And, and, and that's the importance of having fresh blood and having new ideas and giving people like me a chance um, because I do bring fresh ideas and I do want to make this work. I want it to work for not just me, not for my interest, but for everybody. Everybody should be involved. We have a duty to be involved. You ran for office. I'd love to see you run for office again. We need to keep involved. Mm, well, <laughs> I don't know. You might be in the minority of people who want to see me run again. I know that the state GOP was not super thrilled <laughs> with, with me. I wasn't their uh, their poster child, but I really appreciate that. That's a very sweet thing for you to say. Do you? I um, think do you? Great. I think they're great. I do. Oh, that, I do. That's that's it's awfully social, swell. You're still you still have some good ideas, and why should anybody judge you if if you want to do something good? Well, I mean, actually, I, I would say I would say almost the opposite. I would say I'm happy to have people judge me, but I would like to be judged, and indeed, I would like everyone to be judged as individuals. And right. um, one of the problems that I had with politicking in general was this concept of brand, that everything you do is part of a brand. And um, I, I find, you know, personally, obviously, it's kind of constricting, but I also just don't think that, like, if you would were to... Uh, survey the founding fathers that it's what they would have hoped for I think it's sort of a manifestation of party politics which wasn't something that I think was planned into the system I mean I think it's organic and I'm not saying party politics is is evil but I uh, 
the concept that was laid out when we were founded, you know, even Washington said, don't get involved in parties, just be run as individuals, have politicians just yeah. stand and fall on their own merits. And that's really something like if you look at the partisan divide, if you look at, you know, if you look at the, the, the way that the people who do succeed in politics sort of shift with the winds of, of the party bosses, um, it's really something I feel like we've gotten away from. I don't know. Do you feel the same way? I, I think that there, well, I think it's always existed, this wishy-washy. My father used to call me wishy-washy. He used to say to me, I, uh, I was a public speaker in high school and participated in the Voice of Democracy contests, and you have to come up with a speech. And he'd always say to me, your speech is too wishy-washy. Throw it out, start over. Because you have to make a stand. It doesn't mm. do you any good to sit there and tell people what you think they want to hear. You need to make a stand and let them know where, where you really stand on an issue because only then can they judge whether or not they agree with you. And yeah, I think that yeah. politicians, as you said, they tend to be too wishy-washy. They want to get elected so badly that they lose sight of the fact that they need to represent the interests of people. And sometimes their interests aren't the same as the people's. And when the people don't vote for them, maybe they didn't agree with those issues. Maybe it's right. not personal. But if you right. don't tell them where you stand, how are they going to know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Do you um? So you you grew up in in Rockland, you said, right? Yes. Yeah. Um. But but you don't still live you don't still live in Rockland, right? You live sort of out in Western Mass or something. I have moved around. I've lived just about everywhere. <laughs> okay. Right now, I live in Marlboro. Oh, you live in Marlboro? Okay. I yeah, live in Marlboro now. I just moved there three months ago from Amherst. Okay. And, so uh, so uh, all right. When you said you lived in Marlboro, I was like second guessing myself because I was like, oh. Ted, you moron, you didn't do good research because I had this notion that you live out a little further out west, but okay, you just moved there from Amherst. When you okay. met my son Peter a year ago, we were living in Colerain. So, Colerain, okay. <laughs> which is Franklin County, Franklin County. So I've been all over the state. Um, gotcha. And I like that. I like being able to, and I think that's important because your senator is going to be moving around. I'm going to be part-time in Washington, D.C. and part-time in Massachusetts. Well, um, you know, so the other thing like, that's... The other thing that's good about it is Massachusetts, I know it's geographically one of the smaller states, but it's, you know, it's a well-populated state, and there's sort of a lot of diversity in Massachusetts from one end of it to the other. So it's good. It, you would think that it would be good to have a senator who not only wasn't a carpetbagger from Oklahoma, but who actually, just within Mass, had seen all the sort of different sides of it and met the different kinds of people that you're liable to meet if you're, you know, if you're in in Western Mass versus if you're on the North Shore versus if you're in Boston versus if you're on the Cape, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I always tell people I'm homegrown. I mean, if you need to know where to buy quail eggs, I can tell you there's a store in Marlboro and there's a store in Holyoke. And, it, you know, I've been there. I've been. I've lived in these locations. I know what the area is like. I know what the people feel. I've, these are my neighbors. These are people that I, I talked with on a daily basis. And when I visit, I'm perfectly comfortable in each of those locations. There isn't any place in the state that I don't feel comfortable because I've, I've moved around a lot or I travel a lot. I mean, my poor little car has 225,000 miles on it, and wow. it's only 10 years old. <laughs> what do you drive? I drive a 2008 Toyota Solera convertible, bright red. Woman of the people. I like it. I am, I am, I'm a wild girl, yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So, but I get um, 28 miles a gallon, so I can't complain. That's great. That's great gas mileage. Wow, that's not a yeah. wow. Yeah, well, um, it's a V6 engine. Yeah. You you mentioned that your mother, obviously, your mom's Italian, and I can tell just from how, um, let's say, how garrulous and animated you are that that's had an impact on you. Um, but you mentioned her mentioning your or saying basically, if you don't like this country you should leave and that that seems in keeping with a sort of like american melting pot mythos of the united states being open to people from all over but sort of doing a good job of assimilating those people do you think that we're do you think that maybe we've gotten away from that and and I, I'll, I'll throw my cards on the table here and say that this is my suspicion or concern that i i feel like it isn't necessarily xenophobic to notice or point out that we're not doing a good, as good of a job of assimilating people as we, you know, who, who are maybe new to our country as we used to, perhaps as a byproduct of our culture not being as 
I don't know, as resilient or galvanized or monocultural as it used to be. But what do you think about that? Well, I have a story for you. Sure. <laughs> when I lived in Italy for one year, I attended school. And first of all, as, as a person who was not a citizen of Italy, I was not allowed in the public schools, period. They didn't, their tax money does not support anyone who is not a citizen. So I had to attend private school. And they made no accommodations for me for the fact that I did not speak any Italian. So I had to learn very quickly how to speak Italian in order to attend school. And I learned the language within three months. So my attitude is we bend over backwards here in trying to get people to feel comfortable. We need to remove that comfort zone so that it can assimilate by by not allowing the the multi-languages and, and all the classes in different languages. We need to force, and children learn quickly, we need to force people to assimilate so that they feel comfortable. My mother said that she came to the United States, she didn't speak any English. She watched television, she listened to music, she talked with her neighbors. She had to learn the language. And she was a big advocate of that you to assimilate you must learn the language first you must get involved with your community and and i learned that from her and then having lived in italy i had to do that myself as well and i think that was the best lesson i ever learned uh having to assimilate to another culture um if i had stayed and i was they, my family offered to keep me there if i had stayed i could have melted in because i had learned the language i understood the culture and i think that's the same we have to remember here is that when people come here they have to be prepared to become American. That's all. Was your dad, your dad was a Marine, was he stationed over in Italy? He was, he was, um, no, he was, he happened to be there for a uh, two weeks vacation. You know how they have R&R? &R? Sure, and yeah. He walked, <laughs> my mother was a barista, and my father walked into a bar and he sat down. And, uh, you know, baristas in Italy serve both coffee and alcohol. Their bars are full. And so he sat down and they just, you know, neither one spoke the language, so it was kind of, it's, it's a love story in itself in that they tried so hard to communicate with each other, and they would write letters to each other uh, all the time, and they would have to find a, a translator. She would write to him in Italian. They had to find translators to translate the letters, and it, after two years, well, after a year, my mother became so frustrated with this long-distance relationship, she could only see him when he was there on leave. She became so frustrated that she wrote to him in frustration, I don't love you anymore, go away. And the man who translated it was from Danbury, Connecticut, and he translated as, I love you madly, I want to marry you. And my father mailed her an engagement ring. Wow! <laughs> and this guy died like two years later of cancer, so they never found out if he did it on purpose or by accident. Oh, I want to believe he did it on purpose. I want to believe That's he did it on purpose, but wow, what a much more beautiful and romantic world we lived in in the days before Tinder, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that's just a great story. I love that story. That is wonderful. It's just a love story. And, you know, yeah. they were married so long. She just died two years ago. Oh, so, I'm sorry uh, for your loss. Yeah. My condolences. That, yeah. She was a wonderful lady, and my father still adores her. Um and he is my biggest supporter of this campaign because, like I said, all through my life, he's been uh, so helpful in making me analyze why I do what I do. And until you understand why you make decisions, you're going to make bad ones. Yeah. Everyone makes a bad decision, but you have to be able to learn from it. And you can't learn from it unless you understand why you did what you did. And so right, he's been right. so good at, at really making me stop and think, why are you doing what you're doing? And is it is it something that you're proud of it, or is it just ego feeding? You know, is it something right. that's selfish? Right. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna think that I'm the king of leading questions here, but you've said so much that it's sort of I'm I'm getting triggered. You know, I mean, you're you're uh, <laughs> you're touching you're 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 pushing buttons and lights are going off in my head. You 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 said a while ago, but I want to go back to it if if you don't mind. You you mentioned um, Elizabeth Warren's sort of declaration that she just could not work with. The, incoming the then incoming administration and this is a super leading question but I'm going to throw it at you anyway because I think it's important and, and whatever I want to ask about it. D do you think there's a sort of hypocrisy here because I remember when, when Obama was president a lot of the a lot of the invective from the left towards the or, or targeted at 
the Republican Congress uh, centered around the this concept or this idea of obstructionism, right? Like, well, the Republicans are just uh, naked and purposeless obstructionists. They're just obstructing for partisan reasons. And I remember not being too swayed by that because I felt like, okay, well, you know, maybe... Maybe you're right. Maybe there's some partisanship involved, but there are also, you know, policy reasons why we wouldn't want to just vote for whatever, you know, the president wants. But what really struck me was that when Trump was elected, it was like there was this mass amnesia. Do you know what I mean? And right. uh, suddenly all, this, all the people who were so worried about obstructionism, suddenly it was like their patriotic duty to, <laughs> to, to refuse to, uh, to offer the, the tiniest of olive branches to, to the incoming president. Did you see that too? Yes, yes. And you know what? I fault them for that because some of them have their self-interest in mind. They want to get reelected or they want to preserve the status quo. But, you know, I was a big, growing up in Massachusetts, I was a big fan of Tip O'Neill, believe it or not. And I read his book, um, Speaker, The Man of the House. That's a great book, by the way. Um, it's, you can only get it in paperback or hardcover. You can't get it on the Kindle. And basically he says that 9 to 5, he, he represents his people. He works as a Speaker of the House. He's representing Massachusetts. But after that, he, he's friends with Reagan. He, you know, he... The, these, they're all friends together. They need to be able to have a lot more in common and spend more time with each other so that when they are going to argue on the floor, they really understand the position they're coming from. Because I don't think it's a nine-to-five job. I think that as you get to know each other, like you and I, we have our differences and issues. But as we get to know each other, you'll understand where I'm coming from, from my background, and I understand where you're coming from. And we can kind of find something in the middle. But they've become so far apart, so distant, they don't spend any time together. They show up for their vote. And if you've ever watched C-SPAN, they just show up. They do what they have to do. A lot of times, C-SPAN, they're giving a speech, and it's an empty room. You know, how disrespectful is that? Get to work. And show up and listen to your your uh, your colleagues. So they don't right. even listen to each other. And then the other thing that think- you'll see on, on C-SPAN all the time is they'll, like, impanel a bunch of, you know, whatever, uh, expert witnesses for some subcommittee. And then, like, as, you know, as the committee hearing is going on, somebody will somebody will show up, like, an hour and 20 minutes late, and then they'll read a speech of their own, you know, and then they'll and then wander wait. off. Yeah, a speech that their aides wrote for them. Yeah, it is. You're right. It is very disrespectful, isn't it? I, I find that there's a lot of arrogance. And um, by replacing these people, we need to individually pick them out and replace them. If you, you're not doing the job, then you need to get out. And I'm, I want to start with Elizabeth Warren. She triggered me when she said she can't work because I, I hate to hear somebody say I can't work with somebody. I don't get to pick and choose my colleagues. And, and that triggered me to, to step up and take action. And honestly, that is my motivation. I'm glad you brought it up again because that is my motivation. When she said that, I said, wait a minute, I can replace you. And we need to replace these people one by one so that we have a functioning government. Because yeah. it's broken right now. It's broken. So you said that you um, were a foreign policy major and then you, you minored in Russian. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't remember the language that well. Uh, um, but, I, yes, I was a linguist. I speak uh, – at one point I spoke French, Spanish, Italian, and Russian. Wow, so three Romance languages and then a Cyrillic language just thrown in yeah. to the mix, just to just to throw you off, huh? <laughs> um, so, so obviously, foreign policy is a big part of a senator's job, and Russia is, um, for better or worse, sort of on the radar a lot these days. How do you feel? How do you feel about our relationship with Russia now? So glad you asked because I am the only candidate who has foreign policy. Nobody uh-huh. else has it. And, and Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey is actually on a committee for foreign policy, and they don't yeah. do anything. And right. then that's what I would love to do. I'd love to get on that committee that Ed Markey's on so that I can be actively involved in foreign policy. I, you know, I'm, I have to say I agree so much with what Trump is doing. See, Russian history, it, <laughs> and I've looked at them from a historical perspective, both Soviet and Russian, and um, I, I loved Catherine the Great. Um, you know, I've gone through their history, and they are a people that only recognize, only respect a type A individual. So you have to be powerful against them. You can't sweet-talk them. And I think that Trump 
even though he can be crass, even though people find him offensive, that's because of our culture. When he's in their culture, they respect that. And, th- and he has to be continue to be supported in his international affairs because he has actually known these people for years personally. And he does know what makes Putin tick. And he's very good at, at the international negotiations. He knows when a deal is good and he knows when a deal is bad. The deal that we had under Obama that John Kerry put together was bad. It was very weak. And that was inappropriate. We need to have people in office who understand the culture and the history of the countries that we're working with. Mm-hmm. Do you see Russia as, I mean, it, it seems like their relationship with the United States is has badly frayed over the past decade. I remember when I was young, it was like, you know, we were working together in terms of like the like space program, we were working together, and the idea that Russia was our enemy seemed like laugh laughably old-fashioned, you know, antiquated. And, and actually, Obama um, sort of uh, got in a little jab about this, I, I want to say, in 2012, when he said something to Romney to the effect of, like, well, look, the Cold War it called, and they want their foreign policy back or something. You know, um, <laughs> it, it, seemed, it seemed to, for a time, like things were really, things were really getting better and better for, for our relationship with Russia. And then, for some reason, and I will say that I have suspicions about, you know, about sort of the underlying reasons, but I don't see any good, solid rationale for it. It seems like our relationship with them in the past five years has really rapidly deteriorated. Do you think that this is warranted, or do you think that it's a mistake? I think that we don't need to have the kind of public animosity of the Cold War. Um, and and uh, unfortunately, the media plays into that a lot. I'm not saying we should be best friends with them. We shouldn't be hugging them and all of that. I mean, certainly, and the, that's not their culture anyway. They would never respect us. They did not respect Obama. They did not respect uh, Bill Clinton. They, they're not into the touchy-feely, let's get warm together and make, you know have coffee or tea. They're not like that. Um, so we have to approach our dealings with them in a, in a situation which they can relate to from their culture, from their perspective. Just as you don't jump into conversation about business right away with some people and other cultures, it's all business. And with them, it's all business. So I think that our relationship has deteriorated because when the Soviet Union fell, we were very helpful in uh, teaching them how to become capitalist. And they got good at it. And they're very good at it. Um, Their technology has has blossomed uh, to the point where they're great hackers. Uh, but the the fact is is that they have they have uh, matured, and we need to recognize that and treat them a little differently, um, rather than now that they've matured and they're feeling self self esteem, we we can't revert back to the Cold War mentality. We need to. I'm not saying we should work together with them, but we need to treat them a little bit uh, differently, rather than as you know enemies. We need to uh, recognize that they're a force of their own. I'm, I mean, they're one sixth of the planet. <laughs> we can't right, ignore right. the fact that the, the, geographically they're a big country. Um, sure. Well, so, even so even like, in terms of population, I mean, they, they have a, a population of about 150 million people. They're not a small country. They have a huge GDP. They have a huge military, one of the biggest in the world. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're not inconsequential, certainly. Um, so I think it, if we could put some politics aside and work with them, as you said, with scientific projects, projects that will bring us together. In time, the politics will follow. Um, we have to have common interest. It's like dating. Uh, you have to have some common interest or it's not going to work. Instead, right. what we've been doing is just throwing all of this propaganda around, like trying to put them back in that little shoebox where they, they weren't mature enough and they weren't good at capitals. They've, they've matured. They are good at it now. So now we have to try to treat them a little differently that, that they may require a little more finesse. So... Do you think that what's underlying this, like, Russophobia that we see in the media is just a, a failure to understand the maturation of Russia as a, as a country from sort of the post-Cold War economic wreck to the present situation, which, as you say, is not that bad? Or do you think that there's some other motive? No, I agree with you. I think that we, it's, it's just propaganda to, 
to encourage this, they're the evil ones and we're the good ones. What we need to focus on is if we're going to make them mature, one of the things that they're terrible at is human rights. They are awful at that. And we are sort of like the world leader in, in promoting human rights. So we should be working with them to improve that next. They've improved on their capitalism. We need to improve on the human rights worldwide. And unfortunately, the UN has failed. The UN has failed to do the job that they were supposed to do. And as the largest uh, backer of the UN and with the most influence, it's our job to make the UN either do their job or to be disbanded. And what would it mean? What What would it mean in this context to make making the UN do their job? Well, the human they're they're in charge of human rights, so um, they need to. They have standards. They have investigators. They have they have all of those resources that all the countries agree upon. And when the UN doesn't uh, perform, and for instance, the UN came out a year ago and said that the human rights violations in Ethiopia were a crisis situation that was critical and yet they've done nothing in the past year now only the past week has something been done but that was because the united states got involved and the leaders in ethiopia uh did uh release political prisoners they closed down some of their concentration camps so the u.s has a lot of influence in the world uh the world theater so if we could force the russians to become more um, humanitarian, then their people will benefit from that. And and then we don't have to be enemies. We do not have to be enemies. We may be politicians, but we don't need to be enemies. Let's suppose for a second that we could not do that. And let's just imagine, I'm not, I, I, yeah. I certainly don't mean to accuse Russia of this, but suppose that they were like the worst country in the world for uh, human rights. Would that necessitate our being enemies? Or could we still get along with them? And to get no, I think sort it goes across. I think it goes against our democratic ideology. Okay. Remember that our forefathers said democracy is based on five five parts: social equality, majority rule, minority rights, freedom, and integrity. So, social equality is one of our our foundations of what we believe in the United States. So, if people are not um, in congruence with that. Uh, we have an ideological break, and we can't work with them. How could you possibly want to see them make money and if their their people are ex- uh, exploited and treated badly? Because well, then you'd be hypocrites. To externalize, it from, to externalize it from Russia for a second, let's take, because I think Russia is a little contentious, but let's take a country that basically everybody, no matter where they are in the political divide, unless they're just hammer and sickle far left, can agree on, and that would be North Korea. Surely North Korea is, is a really dysfunctional potentate, right? But what, what, I would say, what I would say is, even as dysfunctional as they are, I would rather see them have enough to eat. I would rather see them... Have electricity? Rather, yeah, I would rather see them have electricity. I would rather see them grow and prosper, because I don't understand how adding harm to an already bad situation makes it better. Am I naive? Well, I think that this particular leader, this dictator, is is not going to work with us. Uh, so if he was replaced, I would agree with you. Mm-hmm. But this particular individual has indicated that he does not want to work with us. So in, so, terms, of, in terms of North Korea, we've got to smoke out Kim Jong-un first, and then we, can, then we can turn on the nice, we can put on the kid gloves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. That's, um, and that's the CIA's job, by the way. That's not. <laughs> well, but I mean, uh, but a, but a, I mean, a senator, a U.S. senator, is involved in 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 foreign policy at basically all levels. Yeah. I mean, we've got, you know, we've got a foreign intelligence committee. We've got you know foreign policy committees. So, you know, certainly it's 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 any of these things has to be in the purview of a U.S. senator, right? Right. Right. I think that the problem is that um, a, a lot of times uh, we don't want to think about. Uh, our, our, how we affect the world. But the fact is, the United States has quite a bit of influence. People do respect us. They look up to us. And, of course, we only hear on the news about the people that, that criticize us. But there are a lot of people that look up to us and see us as that beacon of hope, that land of opportunity. And so we can flex our muscles in ways that other countries cannot. And right. 
it, it's a very valuable power, and we need to be very conscious of how we're going to use it. And in the case of North Korea, I think we are quite capable of turning that country around and making it prosperous. Mm-hmm. Do you what, what about the cost? Do you think that um, because you know I'm I would say that I sort of came of age, I guess, in like the Ron Paul wing of the Republican Party, and sort of in that movement and one of the big arguments for non-interventionism isn't that well it it would be better for people to stay immiserated and under tyrannical governments but just that once you start focusing on the well-being of people who are not your own citizens there's sort of no end to it because you know in addition to the problems of North Korea there are innumerable other sort of yeah hot spots or low spots or whatever you want to call them around the world where you could make a charitable case or a humane case for intervention. What do you think about the balancing act between uh, the cost of trying to help people in other countries and the obviously the benefits of actually being able to be the ones who help them? Well, I'm definitely a Ron Paul supporter. So <laughs> I understand the isolationism, but we can't be totally isolated uh, because we do have that power to make change. And the thing about North Korea is that it is a priority in the sense that they have ar- he has this dictator has already indicated he intends to to cre- create this hostility with his nuclear bombs. He's already threatened us. And in my book, what my father used to say is if somebody threatens to kill you, you better be prepared to kill them first. You know, you cannot sit back and wait for them to attack. That's a very uh, so, marine thing to say. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so it, I think it's important that we recognize that this particular individual, if he cannot be changed, needs to be removed um, because he is a threat to us, a direct threat. Uh, and, and in this case, I would personally would love to meet with him and try to persuade him. I think I'm a very persuasive person when you meet me. I would like to persuade him. You're a very him persuasive why. person just in this Skype call, so I can believe it. I think I think that's one of the talents I have is being able to see things from their point of view and then being able to convince them that we can work together towards a win-win situation. And I would love to see North Korea improve, the, especially the conditions for the average person. And so if he could understand that we want to help him and that we're not going to try to hurt him be, just because he believes in his philosophy. However, we're never going to be best friends until he starts to um, agree with some ideology about social equality and, and situation like that. Uh, we're never going to be best friends. For the rest of the world, we have to pick and choose which ones are important based on our rate of return. I mean, I hate to say this. I hate to sound really callous and and cold and calculating. But if we're not getting a return on our investment, we need to cut back. Gotcha. Okay. They know that that funding, that help comes with strings. They know that. It's conditional. So we need to flex our muscles and say, hey, you're not producing for us. You're not doing what we asked you to do that was contingent upon that, um, such as Pakistan. Pakistan's not following through. Too bad. You're done. You know, we have to start to pull back and say, no, we're not going to be there for you because you're not you're not there for us. Yeah, I think that I mean, that seems like a fair appraisal. I know that Trump has talked about Pakistan in particular and foreign aid is something that's also I mean, you said you were Ron Paul supporter. I can I definitely respect that. His son Rand has talked a lot about foreign aid. Do you see yourself as somebody who, when elected to the Senate, would sort of fall into Rand Paul's? wing when it comes to this issue yeah i would tend to be working with him yeah uh, the the problem i have with Rand paul and I, I know this is just just going back in history is that when his father was running for office he spoke up against his father and and i will <laughs> i can't forgive him for that because as a parent i would hope that none of my children would do that to me they're all involved in my campaign and i would feel betrayed um so i will always hold that against Rand paul but Otherwise, I think that a lot of the things that he does is good, but I'll always look at him as somebody that can't be completely trusted. Wow. Very, a very open appraisal. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, and, and very insightful. I mean, you're right. It is, that is a sort of a damning thing. But I've, that was honestly the last thing I expected you to say. Very honest appraisal. 
very honest appraisal. Um, you you said that uh, you've you're sort of a hybrid. You know, you mentioned that you are a registered Republican but a card carrying libertarian. Is that do, yeah. is that? Do you feel like that's a sort of a, that you're sort of squaring a circle with that? Yes. In fact, I've had Republicans tell me that I'm not a true Republican, and I've had Libertarians tell me I'm not a true Libertarian, and, oh, and it's wow. true. I can't be. I can't be just one. Um, you know, I I believe in the um, the HR 38 Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act. That's something that both parties agree on. So, in that sense, I'm truly Republican. But then, when it comes to the cannabis issue, I believe that if a state has already made it legal, then we have to respect that, and the federal government should back off. And that is totally libertarian. <laughs> okay, well then so, here let's do a, let's do a little thought experiment if you if you don't mind, Heidi. And by the way, I really appreciate you're really being very open with this interview, and I I really I really like the fact. I would say just personally, so this is not an endorsement, just so our listeners understand. Yeah. But personally, I find it very refreshing to talk to somebody who's running for office, and instead of like being really cagey about every statement that they make they're just laying it out and saying here's how i see the world i think that's a breath of fresh air but so so let's do this this thought experiment what would you say is your most libertarian position that you know if if people heard it they would be like yep she's definitely a libertarian and then what would you say is your least libertarian position well the libertarians do believe in term limits um so so i guess that's where i'm coming from is you know, I did consider running as a libertarian, and I was asked to run as a libertarian once I was already running as a Republican. So the libertarians do accept me, um, but the fact is that my there are some things that I am not libertarian on. For instance, uh, the pro-life issue. Um, I was raised Roman Catholic, and as much as I have at times not been practicing, um, in my heart, I do believe that every life is sacred. I do believe that life begins at conception. So, and having seen that um, PBS special in 1984 called Silent Scream, which is on YouTube, uh, that really shaped my life. That was an important point in my life where I was like 17 or 18 years old and I watched that documentary about an abortion at 11 weeks. And I said, no way am I ever going to endorse that. No way. Um, because the baby has rights. So when it comes to um, pro-life and abortion issues, I used to think that I was pro-choice. And I'll tell you why. Because I thought pro-choice meant, like, how are you going to choose for your body? Like vaccines and stuff? No. And then I came to realize that pro-choice is really about pro-abortion. And I am not in favor of abortion. But as a politician, I am not in favor of funding abortion. So if your private health care will fund it, all the best to you. Keep it private, but I am not in favor of publicly funding any abortions. Okay, so, so I want to. I want to. Th- this is a little bit nuanced, so I just want to make sure I understand. Your policy position on this is that you want to make sure that no, that the, that the government is not funding the practice, but you wouldn't want to ban it. Is that right. correct? Okay. I'm right. Again, the government shouldn't be funding that. That comes out of your private health insurance. And now that everyone is supposed to have health insurance, why would the government fund it, right? So if you're all having health insurance and it's paying for all of these medical necessities, the government should not be funding it. I think that anything that has to do with our bodies is is our choice, but the government doesn't have any involvement in it. The government well, me- should not be telling me to have a vaccine. The government shouldn't be giving me the vaccine, even if it's free. No, I choose. What about all those Amish people? What about all those Jehovah Witnesses? What about all those Christian scientists who, right. who want to practice their own method of, of health insurance or, or health care? You know, we okay. shouldn't be involved in forcing that. So then let me ask you, uh, let me ask you a Tenth Amendment question then. Um, s- let's let's take it as read that Heidi Wellman would not be in favor of a federal ban on feticide. Suppose that uh, like a state like Oklahoma, which almost they almost they were a hair's breadth away from passing uh, an abortion ban, and their governor their governor vetoed it. But if if she hadn't vetoed it, it would be the law in Oklahoma now that you know that abortion was not legal. Um, would you would you be in favor of the federal government preventing a state from banning it just within? just as a matter of state law? I think state law trumps 10th okay. Amendment. So 
So the same argument about abortion, the same argument about cannabis, if the states have said that you cannot have an abortion, then the federal government backs it. Okay. So if the sta- so the, so there are federal laws right now on the books, and in fact Jeff Sessions just said he's going to start enforcing them again. There are federal laws saying you can't sell recreational marijuana. You just can't do it. Um, and, you know, they justify it under the Commerce Clause or whatever. And we can we don't need to argue about the justification. That's not my point here. But the point is the, the laws are being ignored by states like Colorado. Um, and, then, and then Sessions turns around and says, okay, we're going to start enforcing this and, 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 and stop these states from doing this. You would say that's a mistake, that, that, um, that really it's better to let the states... Uh, the states decide for themselves, which is, I'm not saying that's unreasonable, I actually think it's perfectly reasonable, to what their policy should be. Actually, that's what I did say. I went on Twitter and Facebook as soon as that came out and said just that. Okay. <laughs> well, then then you've got to forgive me for not for not reading that. <laughs> that I, I tried to do my research, Heidi. I tried to, completely. yeah, I tried to do my research, but I didn't, I didn't catch everything. <laughs> Well, it's um, recent, you know? <laughs> right, right. So then you would also say, then you would apply that same reasoning to to feticide, to abortion. Right. If it's not in the Constitution as a federal, uh, for the federal government to uh, invo- be involved with, then it belongs to the states. And if it's not in the state's Constitution, it belongs at the local level. Let me ask you another uh, libertarian-republican hybrid question then. Did you, in... in the 16 cycle, did you support the Gary Johnson or did you support Trump for president? I supported or, Trump. You supported Trump, okay. Yeah. And why... I did and, not support Johnson, nope. And why not? Why not... Uh, what was what was wrong with Gary Johnson? Or what well, was right about Trump? I mean, either any justification is fine, but I... You know, and, and just so you know, full disclosure, I also voted for Trump. So, so we're on the same yeah. page, but just so our, our listeners know what your sort of thinking was. Well, I... I, I did not agree with Johnson. I didn't think that he had a strong position, and I didn't like the fact that he chose William Weld as a running mate. Um, I thought he was just trying to grab that Republican vote for, for um, publicity. And then he he then later became really too cozy with Hillary Clinton. Um, and I just didn't see him as a true libertarian uh, in the Ron Paul sense. Right. And, um, and, and I like that even though Trump has his personal faults, even though, personally, I would never have coffee with him. I would not consider him a friend of mine on a personality level. He spoke his mind like I do. He was genuine. And I honestly believe that his his intentions were good. That who in their right mind would want to run for president and give up all the income that they have and, and all, all of the respect as a businessman? Why would you do that and be under the microscope? of all the people to criticize you. Why would you do that unless you really wanted to do something good? So I think he was genuine. And and mm. that's very important that we feel that our leaders can be persuaded later to to have new ideas. As new information comes in, we need to reevaluate our positions. But if a person is genuine and really wants to do a good job, then we should encourage them to, to bring that out, that they yeah. should maintain that integrity. It was about yeah. integrity. It really comes down to integrity. I thought Trump had more integrity than Gary Johnson. This is I feel like this is a gotcha question, but I have to ask. So if Trump if Trump called you up and said, you know, Heidi, uh, I noticed your campaign, I think you're really interesting, I'd love to have coffee, you would say no, you wouldn't have coffee with him? Oh, I would. I would. He wouldn't be like my best we wouldn't be doing it on a regular basis, but I would I would definitely jump at the chance in in put the bill myself to go to DC to have coffee with them. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, um, okay, so we've been talking for an, uh, about an hour at this point. Um, I want to be sensitive to your time needs. I'm having a blast. I think you're really interesting and you're on a roll, but if you need to go, just let me know, okay? Okay. Um, I'm good. Do you have any other questions? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a couple. Um, you said that you were always involved in, in campaigning. Um, is this your first? Is this your first time running for office? I don't remember if you said that. I remember you saying that you've been involved in other campaigns. No, I. This is my first um, attempt um, because I, I'm one of those people that I don't do it unless I really mean it. Um, yeah. And I wanted to make it clear that this is a very special 
uh, campaign that it's it's triggered by something that she said it's not that I'm looking to have that that uh, status right. she said that she couldn't work with them so I was I was perfectly content to continue what I was doing and have been doing since 1980 which is working in the background helping other candidates uh, working on uh, town committees you know I was on I was a secretary of the Rockland Zoning Board of Appeals I was the I was on the Historical Commission and became the chairman of the Historical Commission in Abington. And I was a member of the Board of Health in Coleraine. So I've always been active in the background, and I would have been happy to stay there. Um, But when duty calls, you need to step up and say, here are my talents. And we do not waste talents. When you have a talent, you, you feel like you have to do it. A writer will write even if they don't make money. So when you have something and you know you have something to give, you, it's your duty to perform. Yeah, and I can say from experience <laughs> that when you run for office, not only do you not make money, but you lose money. <laughs> Unless you win. I guess maybe if you win, it's different because then suddenly there's like lobbyists or something. But I don't know. Because I, I have noticed this weird trend of people being politicians and then accumulating way more wealth than you think they should on the basis of just what their salary is. But I can say as somebody who's run, and I'm sure you're experiencing this too, it's a lot of -of out-of-pocket cost. A lot. And, you know, a U.S. senator is not supposed to be making money on the side. In fact, they're limited to $32,000 of side income. Uh, But there's the catch. It's it's, certain things are exempt from that. So writing books is exempt from that. Uh, Passive income is exempt. So Nancy Pelosi, who is a millionaire, it's because she owns real estate. And uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, writes books. And so they, they get around that in a loophole. And, I, again, I can't stress enough how it is important that they be held accountable to the same laws as us. Um, I work in insurance, and I work here full time. And I know that my boss asked me when I started the campaign, you're not going to mix the two, right? Because you can't. You have to keep the two separate. So there should be no sure. conflict of interest. When you're at work, you should be 100% at work. And when you're in your own time, that that's fine. But you should not mix. The t- you should not be writing books from your office, and you should not be investing in real estate or stock market while you're in office. So I think we need to hold people more accountable to that. And in my case, um, I just filed my year-end report, and I personally, out of pocket, put in over eight thousand dollars into this campaign. And I have not been receiving any donations, and that's my fault because I'm not very good at asking. So. If, if we could just remind the listeners that a donation would be nice because, believe it or not, the way the system works is I am not a contender in this race until I have money cutting in, which is ridiculous because I'm a grassroots. I'm grassroots. So grassroots isn't about the money. And this is one of the things I'm trying in, in my campaign. I'm trying to limit it to $2 million because nobody, nobody in this campaign can outspend Elizabeth Warren, who has over right. $11 million. Nobody's right. going to outspend her. So you have to be more um, – calculating as to how you're going to get those votes. And I'm going back to the old school way from back in the 1980s where you go door to door. It's the proven method. Everybody uh, has has always said that the only way you're going to get votes is to meet those voters face to face. And in a state of, of 7 million people, that's a lot of people. But the point is, is that if I can reach even a small percentage, say 2 million people, if I can meet them and talk to them and let them know what I'm really about and that I'm looking for their interest that, and they vote for me, then I can prove that anybody can run for office. Anybody. You don't have to be a millionaire. You don't have to have the PAC money. You don't have to have those huge donations and those fancy uh, buses and, and RVs and office space and Anybody can run, and and not only anybody, but somebody even working full time can run for office. So that again will then raise hope for people who hadn't thought about running for office before. I think my campaign is very important for people to realize that I'm trying to be a trendsetter here and showing you can do it too. I'm doing it, you can do it, and I've spent eight thousand dollars so far. But I would like to have a few donations uh, to be able to show. If nothing else, to be able to show that people do support me because it, it doesn't look like it, it, I'm not getting the attention that I need by not having donors. Uh, I'm making my point that I'm self-funding and that you don't need a lot of money. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of the mainstream media is looking for those numbers. So if anybody could donate, my website is www.heidi4senate.com. 
but again, Heidi, www.heidi, H-E-I-D-I, four, not the number four, but the word four, four Senate, F-O-R, Senate.com. Heidi for Senate.com. So you, you heard it here, folks. Uh, I, I would say you've been wonderfully open. Um, again, this is not an endorsement. I, this is not Ted Busick's endorsement of, of Heidi Wellman. I'm saying if you appreciate what you heard, check her out and throw her a few shekels. I can say from uh, personal experience, when you're running for office, uh, money is uh, money's in short supply. Because there's always yeah. a lot of other people running for office, and everybody's basically clamoring for the same dollar. Right. So yeah, right. www.heidiforsenate.com. Um, before we wrap up, I think we, I think this is great. I think we've done great. But before we wrap up, I want to ask, you know, one of the frustrations I would say is like if you're doing interviews as a candidate or whatever, is everybody wants to talk about what they're interested in, and I want to make sure that we didn't miss anything that you think is really important that we should hit. No, I think I covered everything. Yeah. Wow, did you? <laughs> All right. I, ru- I wrung every last drop out of you. You did. You did a great interview. Thank you. We talked about money, but do you need volunteers? Do you want to put in a plug for or appeal for volunteers? Yeah, volunteers are great. <laughs> uh, by the way, like, you almost sound like you hadn't thought about that. I mean, could you use volunteers? Do you need, if, if you got, you know, if, if 12 people called you, I don't expect that's going to happen. That would be that would be over-inflating the, the size of this platform. But suppose 12 people called you tomorrow and said, hey, I heard your interview and I want to help out. Could you use that many extra pairs of hands? You know what I could use? I know this is funny. I need 10,000 signatures for nomination. I'm not worried about that, believe it or not. Nomination papers come out September, uh, February 13th. I'm looking forward to that. I think that's a great opportunity for me to go door to door. But what I do need, what I am worried about, is that Republican convention on April 28th. I'm very concerned about getting that 15% to move forward, and I'm very concerned about the fact that they're going to require a speaker fee, which I consider to be extortion, and they're going to have a speaker fee either 10000 or $25,000 that the party is extorting from their own candidates so they can cover the cost of the convention. Now, who plans something and doesn't have a budget, right? So why should the candidate, it, it's anti-democratic to charge your candidates for them to speak in order to get nominated. So if there is anything, I would love to have a bunch of volunteers standing in front of the DCU Center in Worcester that day, April 28th, holding up my signs to show support because I want the delegates to feel comfortable supporting me and giving me that nomination. How much is the speaker's fee? In the past, it's been either ten thousand or twenty-five thousand. Uh, Jesus. In two thousand and fourteen, um, Mark Fisher was charged twenty-five thousand dollars to speak. Yeah, and well, that wasn't the only way that they, you know, tried right. to screw over Mark Fisher. So you're worried right. about the convention. Terribly you're worried afraid, that so, afraid of cronyism. Yes. So you think they didn't learn any lessons from from the Mark Fisher situation that they might try to they might try yeah. to pull a fast one on you okay well that's a very i would say that's a very fair concern given you know recent history and what an interesting uh inversion you know if you're a democrat then you get paid uh you know the the price of a upscale mansion for giving a speech if you're a republican you have to pay for the privilege of giving a speech so we live in very different worlds here (laughs) politically you know a party should be charging their own candidates you're not encouraging candidates I um, agree with you 100%. I think it's explicitly undemocratic to say, hey, you can you can throw your hat in the ring if you're willing to give us this huge, exorbitant amount of money. So right. you so said that... The Republican Party is getting, they can't pay for their own convention. You know, they charge the delegates $90. So the delegates are, are being charged to go to the convention. Now, when I went to the Libertarian Convention back in October, they charged $20 and it was in a hotel room. You know, twenty dollars versus ninety dollars for a delegate. Do the Libertarians already have a, a U.S. Senate candidate? No. Would you consider running as a Libertarian if suppose that the suppose that the state mass state GOP, which you know I'm on record as being not a fan or an admirer of the mass Massachusetts state GOP, suppose that they really screwed you over um, and. You know, maybe I'm not going to say, look, you're a shoe in to be the nominee. I don't think that that's true, but I think that I definitely think you have a shot. Anybody's got a shot at this point. But suppose that they suppose that they pull the rug out from under you. Would you be willing to run? Would you consider running as a libertarian? 
Well, this is where my political science comes in, <laughs> the, the degree. Um, and, and the libertarians actually have been very helpful in – they have training exercises where you call in for a webinar. And one of the libertarians said this about – because I do believe in the libertarian party as a third party. He said if there is an election where there is a Democrat and a Republican running, do not run as a libertarian. The third party cannot win. If the Democrat has no opponent or the Republican has no opponent from the other party, run as a libertarian or as, as a no party. And I did give a consideration running as, as a no party candidate or as a libertarian. And back to the, the strategy uh, as a political scientist, you cannot win. That's the way the system is. You cannot win unless you're a Democrat or Republican. And this is what the Republicans are always angry with me for saying is that I'm a hybrid candidate, but to win, I have to run as a Republican. Okay, well, just as you say that, in my mind, I'm thinking Angus King ran independent and won in a field that had both a Democrat and a Republican. Jesse Ventura won in a field with both a Democrat and a Republican. Um... Lisa Murkowski won as an independent in a field with two main party candidates, and so did Joe Lieberman. Do you think that the difference there is that those people had pre-standing star power? Is that what it is? Yes, I think so. But let's take, for example, Shiva, um, Dr. Shiva Ayodari, who, who was a Republican candidate, and he stepped out. I, I was in contact with Frank Licata at the same time. This was back in October when we were we were talking about this. We were talking about leaving the party if if this would happen, and I chose, uh, after speaking with my campaign staff, we chose to, to stand firm, to stay with the party. Regardless of what happens, we have to stick with the party, because exactly what happened with Shiva, when he left the GOP and he announced that he was going independent, the backlash from the GOP was so bad that you don't even mention his name now. I, I mean, people are so, they feel so betrayed, and it was something that was irritating to me when Ron Paul was running for, for uh president you know i sent money in to to donate to try to help him along and i was so hurt when he didn't get that nomination and i said why doesn't he run as a libertarian why doesn't he run as a as an independent but now i understand why because people will feel hurt they they will not vote you will not get any additional votes if you switch parties so when you start you have to stay with that you have to stay the course regardless of what happens and I have to trust and pray to God that people do the right thing and vote with their hearts and that the delegates do the right thing and say, well, let the voters decide as a primary. We won't do anything to to impede the uh, the ability to show up on the ballot. And that's all I ask. Give me a chance to show up on the ballot and let the voters decide. And that's democratic. Well, I'll say this, Heidi. Um, it, supposing that I, I agree with you. I think that your position makes sense. Um but I would say, supposing that you uh, don't make it, which I, you know, I think there's a, it's a, it's a field with, you know, other people in it, and and um, I would say the favorite, probably the favorite to win right now is Jeff. Um, supposing that you don't make it, what I would love to see, and 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 certainly this isn't, I'm not forecasting that you won't, but I'm just saying, supposing you don't, I would love to see you run for any other office. Um, <laughs> I, well, I honestly Marky would just. Two years. What's that? And Marky comes up in two years. That's right, he does. Because I, <laughs> I really think you've got a lot to say. You've got an interesting perspective, and if you don't make it this time, I really would think that it was a shame. I would think it was a shame if this process burned you out because you're a very interesting person with, I what I would call a very fresh perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So is this is this good? Is this a good place to wrap it up for you? There's nothing else you wanna you wanna throw in? Nope. Nope. I think this is good. Heidi, why not follow her on Twitter? Her handle is at Heidi for Senate 2. And if you aren't yet following me on Twitter, you can find me at, at Ted Busick. The 
Conversation is hosted and produced by me, in association with RedMaskGroup.com, the Bay State's number one site for news and commentary. 